The Alienist. Part 3. Will. Chapter 30. I stepped with trepidation toward a pair of luxuriantly upholstered easy chairs that sat near Morgan's desk and across from the fireplace. Chrysler, however, stood rigidly still, answering the financier's hard stare with one of his own. Before I sit in your house, Mr. Morgan, Laszlo said, may I ask if it is your general custom to compel attendance with firearms? Morgan's large head snapped around to scowl at Burns, who only shrugged in a very unconcerned way. The ex cop's gray eyes twinkled a bit, as if to say, when you lie down with dogs, Mr. Morgan. Morgan's head began a slow, slightly disgusted shake. Neither my custom nor my instructions, Dr. Chrysler, he said, holding out an arm to the easy chairs. I hope you will accept my apologies. This affair seems to have brought out strong emotions in all who have knowledge of it. Chrysler grunted quietly, only partially satisfied, and then we both sat down. Morgan also returned to his seat, and brief introductions were made, save of the two priests behind the settees, whose names I never did learn. After that Morgan gave the slightest of nods to Anthony Comstock, who moved his unimposing little figure into the center of the room. The voice that emerged from that frame proved as thoroughly unpleasant as was the face. Doctor, Mr. Moore, let us be frank. We know of your investigation, and for a variety of reasons we want it stopped. If you do not agree, there are certain matters you will be pressed on. Pressed on, I said, my immediate dislike for the postal censor giving me confidence. This isn't a morals case, Mr. Comstock. Assault, Inspector Burns said quietly, looking at the crowded bookshelves, is a criminal charge, more. We've got a guard at Sing Sing who's missing a couple of teeth. Then there's the matter of consorting with known gangland leaders. Come on, Burns, I said quickly. The inspector and I'd had many run-ins during my years at the Times, and though he made me very nervous I knew it would be foolish to show it. Even you can't call a carriage ride consorting. Burns didn't acknowledge the comment. Finally, he went on, there's your misuse of the staff and resources of the police department. Ours is not an official investigation, Chrysler replied evenly. A smile seemed to grow under Burns's mustache. Kagi, doctor. But we know all about your arrangement with Commissioner Roosevelt. Chrysler showed no emotion. You have proof, inspector? Burns pulled a slender volume from a shelf. Soon. Now, now, gentlemen, said Archbishop Corrigan in his affable way. There's no reason to leap to adversarial positions. Yes, Bishop Potter agreed, without much enthusiasm. I'm sure that an amenable solution can be reached, once we understand one another's points of view. Pierpont Morgan said nothing. What I understand, Laszlo announced, primarily to our silent host, is that we have been abducted at gunpoint and threatened with criminal indictment, simply because we have attempted to solve an abominable murder case which has so far baffled the police. Chrysler pulled out his cigarette case and, removing one of the number within, began to knock it noisily and angrily against the arm of his chair. But perhaps there are subtler elements of this escapade to which I am blind. Blind you are, doctor, Anthony Comstock said, with the annoying grade of a zealot. But there is nothing subtle about the matter. For many years I have attempted to suppress the written work of men such as yourself. An absurdly broad interpretation of our First Amendment by so-called public servants has made that impossible. But if you believe for one moment that I will stand by and watch you become actively involved in civic affairs. A flash of irritation passed over Morgan's face, and I could see that Bishop Potter caught it. Like a dutiful lackey, for Morgan was one of the Episcopal Church's chief benefactors, the bishop stepped in to cut Comstock off. Mr. Comstock has the energy and brusqueness of the righteous, Dr. Chrysler. Yet I fear that your work does unsettle the spiritual repose of many of our city's citizens and undermines the strength of our societal fabric. After all, the sanctity and integrity of the family, along with each individual's responsibility before God and the law for his own behavior, are twin pillars of our civilization. I grieve for our citizens' lack of repose, Chrysler answered curtly, lighting his cigarette. But seven children that we know of, and perhaps many more, have been butchered. But that is a matter for the police, surely, Archbishop Corrigan said. Why involve such questionable work as your own in it? Because the police can't solve it, I threw in, before Laszlo could answer. These were all fairly standard criticisms of my friend's work, but they were making me a bit hot, nonetheless. And, using Dr. Chrysler's ideas, we can. Burns let out a barely audible chuckle, while Comstock's face grew red. I do not believe that is your true motivation, doctor. I believe you intend with the help of Mr. Paul Kelly and whatever other atheistic socialist you can find, 
to spread unrest by discrediting the values of the American family and society. If it seems surprising that Chrysler, and I neither laughed at this grotesque little man's statements nor rose to physically thrash him, it must be remembered that Anthony Comstock, however harmless his title of postal censor might sound, wielded enormous political and regulatory power. Before the end of his 40-year career, he would boast of having driven more than a dozen of his enemies to suicide, and many more than that had their lives and reputations ruined by his persecutory obsessions. Both Laszlo and I knew that while we were a current target, we had not yet entered the ranks of Comstock's permanent fixations, but if we now pushed him to pay such unbalanced attention to us, we might one day arrive back at our usual places of employment to discover ourselves under federal indictment for some trumped-up violation of public morals. For these reasons I said nothing in reply to his outbursts, while Chrysler only breathed smoke wearily. And why? Laszlo finally asked. Should I wish to spread such unrest, sir? Vanity, sir. Comstock shot back. To advance your nefarious theories and gain the attention of an ill-educated and sorely confused public. It seems to me, Morgan said, quietly but firmly, that Dr. Chrysler already receives more attention from the public than he might prefer, Mr. Comstock. None of the others even attempted to agree or disagree with this statement. Morgan rested his head on one large hand and spoke to Laszlo. But these are serious charges, doctor. If they were not, I would hardly have asked that you be brought to this meeting. I take it you are not in league with Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly has a few ideas that are not altogether unsound, Chrysler answered, knowing that the comment would further pique the group around us. But he is essentially a criminal and I have no use for him. I am glad to hear it. Morgan seemed genuinely satisfied with the answer. And what of these other questions about the social implications of your work? I must admit that I am not well acquainted with such matters. But as you may know, I am senior warden of St. George's Church across Stuyvesant Park from your own house. One of Morgan's coal-black eyebrows went up. I have never seen you among the congregation, doctor. My religious opinions are a private matter, Mr. Morgan, Laszlo replied. But surely you realize, Dr. Chrysler, Archbishop Corrigan interrupted cautiously that our city's various church organizations are vital to the maintenance of civic order. As these words were coming out of Corrigan's mouth, I found myself glancing at the two priests who continued to stand like statues behind their respective bishops and suddenly, I got an inkling as to just why we were in that library and talking to that collection of men. This germ of understanding began to grow as soon as it flashed across my brain, but I said nothing, for comment would only have sparked further disagreement. No, I simply sat back and let my thoughts run on, becoming more comfortable as I recognized that Laszlo and I were in less danger than I'd originally thought. Order, Chrysler replied to Corrigan's query, is a word rather open to interpretation, Archbishop. As to your concerns, Mr. Morgan, if what you required was an introduction to my work, I believe I could have suggested an easier route than abduction. No doubt, Morgan answered uneasily. But as we are here, doctor, perhaps you will favor me with an answer. These men have come to solicit my aid in putting an end to your investigation. I would like to hear both sides of the issue before deciding on a course of action. Chrysler sighed heavily, but did go on, the theory of individual psychological context that I have developed. Rank determinism, Comstock declared, unable to contain himself. The idea that every man's behavior is decisively patterned in infancy and youth, it speaks against freedom, against responsibility. Yes, I say it is un, American. At another annoyed glance from Morgan, Bishop Potter laid a calming hand on Comstock's arm, and the postal censor relapsed into disgruntled silence. I have never, Chrysler went on, keeping his eyes on Morgan, argued against the idea that every man is responsible before the law for his actions, save in cases involving the truly mentally diseased. And if you consult my colleagues, Mr. Morgan, I believe you will discover that my definition of mental disease is rather more conservative than most. As for what Mr. Comstock somewhat blithely calls freedom, I have no argument with it as a political or legal concept. The psychological debate surrounding the concept of free will, however, is a far more complex issue. And what of your views on the family as an institution, doctor? Morgan asked, firmly but without any trace of censure. I have heard these and many other good men speak of them with great alarm. Chrysler shrugged, stubbing out a cigarette. I have very few views on the family as a social institution, Mr. Morgan. My studies have focused on the multitude of sins that can often be concealed by the family structure. I have attempted to expose those sins and to deal with their effects on children. I will not apologize for that. But why single out families in this society? Comstock whined. 
Surely there are regions of the world where far worse crimes. Morgan stood suddenly. Thank you, gentlemen, he said to the postal censor and the churchman, in a voice that promised hard measures if there was further argument. Inspector Burns will show you out. Comstock looked a bit nonplussed, but Potter and Corrigan had evidently experienced such dismissal before. They departed the library with remarkable speed. Alone with Morgan, I felt much relieved, and it seemed that Chrysler did, too. For all the man's great and mysterious power, he had, after all, single-handedly arranged the United States government's rescue from financial ruin just one year earlier, there was something comforting in his obvious cultivation and breadth of vision. Mr. Comstock, Morgan said as he sat back down, is a God-fearing man, but there is no talking to him. You, on the other hand, doctor, though I understand very little of what you have told me, I get the feeling that you are a man with whom I can do business. He straightened his fur coat, dabbed at his mustache, and sat back. The mood in the city is volatile, gentlemen. More volatile, I suspect, than you realize. The moment had come, I decided, to share my realizations, and that's why the bishops were here, I announced. There's been more trouble in the slums and ghettos. A lot more. And they're worried about their money. Their money. Chrysler echoed in confusion. I turned to him. They weren't covering for the murderer. They were never concerned with the murderer. It was the reaction among the immigrants that had them spooked. Corrigan's afraid that they'll get angry enough to listen to Kelly and his socialist friends, angry enough to stop showing up on Sunday and coughing up what little money they have. Basically, the man's afraid he won't get to finish his damned cathedral and all the other little holy projects he's probably got planned. But what about Potter? Chrysler asked. You told me yourself that the Episcopals don't have many adherents among the immigrants. That's right, I said, smiling a bit. They don't. But they have something even more profitable, and I'm an ass for not remembering it. Perhaps Mr. Morgan would be willing to tell you. I turned toward the big walnut desk and found Morgan staring back at me uncomfortably, who the largest slum landlord in New York is. Chrysler took in breath sharply. I see. The Episcopal Church. There is nothing illegal in any of the church's operations, Morgan said quickly. No, I replied. But they'd be in a tight spot if those tenement dwellers were to rise up in a mass and demand better housing, wouldn't they, Mr. Morgan? The financier turned away silently. But I still don't understand, Chrysler puzzled. If Corrigan and Potter are so afraid of the effects of these crimes, why obstruct a solution? We have been told that a solution is impossible, Morgan answered. But why try to frustrate an attempt? Chrysler pressed. Because, gentlemen, said a quiet voice from behind us, as long as the case is thought to be unsolvable, no one can be blamed for not solving it. It was Burns again, back in the room without our having heard his approach. The man really was unnerving. The great unwashed, he went on, taking a cigar from a case on Morgan's desk, will be made to understand that these things happen. It's no one's fault. Boys engage in criminal conduct. Boys die. Who kills them? Why? impossible to determine. And there's no need to. Instead, you fix the public's attention on the more basic lesson. Burns struck a match on his shoe and lit a cigar, the tip of which flamed high. Obey the law in the first place and none of the rest occurs. But damn it, Burns, I said, we can solve it, if you'll just get out of the way. Why, just last night on myself. Chrysler stopped me by grabbing my wrist tightly. Burns slowly came over to my chair, leaned down, and let me have a big dose of cigar smoke. Last night you what, more? It was impossible not to remember at such a moment that you were dealing with a man who'd personally beaten dozens of suspected and de facto criminals senseless. A style of interrogation that had become known throughout New York and the rest of the country by the name Burns himself had given it, the third degree. All the same, I attempted defiance. Don't try that strong arm stuff with me, Burns. You've got no authority anymore. You haven't even got your thugs to back you up. I glimpsed teeth behind the mustache. You'd like me to call Connor in? I said nothing, and Burns chuckled. You always had a big mouth, more. Reporters. But let's play it your way. Tell Mr. Morgan here how you'll solve the case. Your principles of detection. Explain them. I turned to Morgan. Well, it won't make sense to men like Inspector Burns, sir, and it may not to you, but we've adopted what you might call a reverse investigative procedure. Burns laughed out loud. What you might call ass backwards. Realizing my mistake, I went for another approach, that is, we start with the prominent features of the killings themselves, as well as the personality traits of the victims, and from those we determine what kind of a man might be at work. Then, using evidence that would otherwise have seemed meaningless, we begin to close in. 
I knew I was on shaky ground and was relieved to hear Chrysler chime in at this point. There is some precedent, Mr. Morgan. Similar efforts, though far more rudimentary, were made during the Ripper murders in London eight years ago. And the French police are currently seeking a Ripper of their own. They've used some techniques that are not unlike ours. The London Ripper, Burns called out, was not apprehended without my hearing about it. Was he, doctor? Chrysler frowned. No. And the French police, using their anthropo hodgepodge, have they made any progress in their case? Laszlo's scowl deepened. Very little. Burns finally did us the decency of looking up from his book. Quite a pair of examples, gentlemen. There was a moment of silence, during which I felt our cause to be weakening. Putting new determination into my words, I said, the fact remains. The fact remains, Burns interrupted, coming back over to us but speaking to Morgan, that this is an intellectual exercise which offers no hope of solving the case. All these people are doing is giving every person they interview the idea that a solution is possible. As I say, that's not just useless, it's dangerous. The only thing the immigrants ought to be told is that they and their children had better obey the laws of this city. If they don't, nobody else can be held responsible for what happens. Maybe they'll find that point hard to swallow. But this idiot Strong and his cowboy police commissioner will be out before long. And then we'll be able to bring back the old force, feeding techniques. Quickly. Morgan nodded slowly, then glanced from Burns to Chrysler. You've made your point, Inspector. I wonder if now you'll excuse us. In contrast to Comstock and the churchman, Burns seemed almost amused by Morgan's curt dismissal. As he left the library, he began to whistle lowly. When the paneled door had closed again, Morgan stood up and looked out a window. It almost seemed as though he was making sure Burns left his house. Can I offer you gentlemen anything to drink? Morgan said at length. After Chrysler and I both declined, our host took one of the cigars from the case on his desk and lit it, then began slowly to pace the thickly carpeted floor. I agreed to see the delegation that has just left us, he announced, out of deference to Bishop Potter, and because I have no desire to see the recent outbreaks of civil unrest go on. Excuse me, Mr. Morgan, I said, a bit amazed by his tone. But have you, or any of the gentlemen who were here, even discussed this matter with Mayor Strong? Morgan passed a hand before him quickly. Inspector Burns's point about Colonel Strong is well taken. I have no interest in dealing with a man whose power is limited by elections. Besides, Strong doesn't have the mind to deal with a matter of this nature. Morgan's heavy, deliberate pacing went on, and Chrysler and I remained silent. The library slowly filled up with thick cigar smoke, and when Morgan finally stood still and spoke again, I could barely see him through the brownish haze. As I see it, gentlemen, there really are only two advisable courses, yours and that advocated by Burns. We must have order particularly now. Why now? Chrysler asked. You are probably not in a position to know, Doctor, Morgan answered carefully, that we are at a crossroads, both in New York and in the country as a whole. This city is changing. Dramatically. Oh, I don't simply mean the population with the influx of immigrants. I mean the city itself. Twenty years ago, New York was still primarily a port. The harbor was our chief source of business. Today, with other ports challenging our preeminence, Shipping and receiving have been eclipsed by both manufacture and banking. Manufacture, as you know, requires workers, and other, less fortunate, nations in the world have provided them. The leaders of organized labor claim that such workers are treated unfairly here. But fairly or no, they continue to come, because it is better than what they have left behind. I mark from your speech that you are of foreign extraction yourself, doctor. Have you spent much time in Europe? Enough. Chrysler answered, to take your point. We are not obligated to provide everyone who comes to this country with a good life, Morgan went on. We are obligated to provide them with a chance to attain that life through discipline and hard work. That chance is more than they have anywhere else. That is why they keep coming. Assuredly, Laszlo answered, impatience beginning to show in his voice. We shall not be able to offer such a chance in future should our national economic development, which is currently in a state of deep crisis, be retarded by foolish political ideas born in the ghettos of Europe. Morgan put his cigar down in a tray, went to a sideboard, and poured out three glasses of what turned out to be excellent whiskey. Without asking a second time if Laszlo and I wanted any, he handed two of the glasses to us. Any events which can be prostituted to serve the purposes of those ideas must be suppressed. That is why Mr. Comstock was here. He believes that ideas such as yours, doctor, can be so prostituted. 
Were you to succeed in your investigation, Mr. Comstock believes that your ideas might gain greater credence. Thus you see, Morgan took up his cigar again and drew in an enormous volume of smoke. You have made yourselves a wide variety of powerful enemies. Chrysler stood up slowly. Need we count you among those enemies as well, Mr. Morgan? The pause that followed seemed interminable, for on Morgan's answer hung any hope of our success. Should he decide that Potter, Corrigan, Comstock, and Burns were right, and that our investigation represented a range of threats to the status quo in our city that simply could not be tolerated, we might just as well fold our tents and head for home. Morgan could arrange the purchase or sale of anyone and anything in New York, and the interference we'd already experienced would be nothing compared to what we'd meet if he decided to oppose us. Conversely, should he signal to the rest of the city's rich and powerful that our effort was to be, if not actively encouraged, at least tolerated. We could hope to proceed without any more severe interference than that which our opponents had already attempted. Morgan finally let out a deep breath. You need not, sir, he said, stamping out his cigar. As I say, I do not understand all of what you gentlemen have explained to me about either psychology or criminal detection, but I make it my business to know men, and neither of you strikes me as having the worst interests of society at heart. Chrysler and I each nodded once calmly, belying the enormous relief that was coursing through our veins. You will still face many obstacles, Morgan went on, in an easier tone than he'd used before. The churchmen who were here can, I believe, be persuaded to stand aside, but Burns will continue to harass you, in an effort to preserve the methods and organization he has spent so many years establishing, and he will have Comstock's support. We have prevailed against them so far, Chrysler answered. I believe we can continue to do so. Of course, I can offer you no public support, Morgan added, indicating the library door and walking with us to it. That would be entirely too complicated. Meaning that, for all his superior intellectual acumen and personal erudition, Morgan was at heart a true Wall Street hypocrite. One who spoke publicly about God and the family, but privately kept his yacht stocked with mistresses and enjoyed the esteem of men who lived by similar rules. He would certainly lose some of that esteem if he were thought to be in league with Chrysler. However, he went on, as he walked us to his front door, since a quick conclusion to the affair is in everyone's best interest, if you should find yourselves in need of resources. Thank you, but no, Chrysler said, as we went out. It would be best not to have even a cash connection between us, Mr. Morgan. You must consider your position. Morgan bridled at the acidity of the comment, and, murmuring a fast good evening, closed the door without shaking hands. That was a little gratuitous, don't you think, Laszlo? I said as we went down the stairs. The man was only trying to help. Don't be so gullible, Moore, Chrysler snapped. Men like that are only capable of doing what they perceive to be in their best interests. Morgan's betting that we're more likely to find the killer than Burns and company are to keep the immigrant population's anger indefinitely suppressed. And he's right. I tell you, John, it would be almost worthwhile to fail, simply to observe the consequences to such men. I was entirely too exhausted to listen to one of Laszlo's tirades and scanned Madison Avenue quickly. We can catch a cab at the Waldorf, I decided, seeing none close by. There was very little activity on the avenue during our descent of Murray Hill, and Laszlo eventually stopped decrying the evils of the group we just left. As we walked on, both silence and weariness deepened, and our entire encounter in the Black Library began to take on a rather unreal quality. I don't think I've ever been so tired. I yawned as we reached 34th Street. Do you know, Chrysler? that for just a second when we first met Morgan I thought he might actually be the killer? Laszlo laughed loud. As did I. Deformity in the face, more, and that nose, that nose. One of the only possible locations for such deformity that we never discussed. Imagine if it had been him. Things are dangerous enough as it is. We found a handsome outside the ornately elegant Waldorf Hotel, whose sister structure, the Astoria, was just being built at the time. And they'll only get more so Morgan's right about that. Burns is a bad enemy to have, and Comstock strikes me as being flat out of his mind. They can threaten all they like, Chrysler answered happily as we climbed into a cab. We know who they are, now, and defense should be an easier matter. Besides, their attacks will grow increasingly difficult. For in the days to come our opponents shall find us mysteriously, Laszlo splayed his fingers out into the air before him gone.